Now I want you to turn with me tonight to the third chapter of John's Gospel. We're delighted tonight to have so many military people. It's been my privilege to speak at many military bases throughout the world, to go to Korea and speak to the troops at Christmas, many years ago at the invitation of General Mark Clark, and uh, then to go a number of times to Vietnam and speak to the troops, and uh, I had some hair-raising experiences on all occasions. But I did uh, hear the story about this uh, one young fellow that had been drafted into the army. And uh, he didn't know the army was gonna be so tough. And he wrote his mother every day. And he said, dear mother, said every day they get us up at 3.30 and 4 in the morning and we have to march for 25 miles. And I'm aching from head to toe. And said, I couldn't wait till Sunday when I knew they were going to let us rest. Said on Sunday, do you know what they did? We had to march 35 miles. And you know, I'm a Catholic. And they took us to a Protestant church. <laughs> and I'd never been in a Protestant church before. And said, the priest stood up and he said, we'll now turn to number 41. Are you weary and heavy laden? And I stood up and shouted, I, yes, sir, I certainly am weary and heavy laden. <laughs> and said, mother, that's why I'm in the guardhouse. <laughs> you know, General Eisenhower, before his death, he said that unless we have a moral and spiritual rebirth throughout the world, one of these days, we're going to wake up in the dust of a thermonuclear explosion. In this third chapter of John, if we would do what Jesus told Nicodemus to do, we might avoid such a disaster. This man, Nicodemus, came to Jesus by night, probably afraid of criticism, or he had a desire for a private conversation, or maybe he wanted to give some more thought before committing himself to Jesus Christ. In any event, he came and he asked Jesus some questions about spiritual life. And Jesus looked him up and down and Jesus said, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. In fact, he said, verily, verily. And any time that Jesus uses that expression, that means that what is going to follow is very important. He said, verily, verily, I say unto you, you must, you have to be born again if you're to enter the kingdom of heaven. Two years ago, when we were touring Poland, when we arrived at the airport in Warsaw, we were met by Bishop Mischiswick, who is head of ecumenical affairs of the Roman Catholic Church, and he put his arms around me, and he said, our churches are open to you. The Episcopate had met and decided to support the invitation of the small Protestant churches of Poland, and so we went to the great Catholic cathedrals all across Poland. While we were there, we met a priest, a Monsignor, who is head of one of the largest theological seminaries in the world. And uh, we were with him quite a number of times, and on this occasion was the first night in Warsaw. He was sitting to my right at a beautiful banquet that they were giving to us. And he said, I want to tell you a story. He said, I got my PhD degree at the University of Chicago. And one day I was riding in a bus and sitting behind me was a black woman. And she punched me on the shoulder and she said, Sir, I beg your pardon, but have you ever been born again? And he said, well, I suppose I have. He said, I'm a, I'm a priest. She said, that's not the question I ask you, sir. I ask you, had you been born again? And he said, well, I, 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 uh, she said, have you been born again? And he said, he went back to his rooms at the, at the university and got his Bible down and turned to the third chapter of John and reread this passage. And this passage spoke to him and he said he got on his knees and he had an experience with Christ that he's never been able to get away from. Now he said, my theology would tell me that I was probably born again at a different period, but he said something happened, you can call it anything you want to, commitment, recommitment, conversion, whatever, something happened to me. Now, the question I want to ask you tonight is, has that ever happened to you? Give it some other title, some other name, if you want.
call it conversion, call it commitment, call it repentance, call it faith, call it whatever. Has it ever happened to you? As it happened to the general that spoke a moment ago, General Nelson. That you've really found Christ and Christ lives in your heart and you know it. Many of you have thought a long time about religion and Christianity. And yet you've never really made a commitment. I had the privilege of speaking at various universities in New England this year and lecturing at some of the major universities like Dartmouth and Harvard and Yale and all those universities. And every place we went, most every place we went, the place was jammed with students and faculty. And I asked the president of one of the universities, I said, well, as the president of Harvard, Dr. Bach. I said, Dr. Bach, what is the greatest need that you see at Harvard this year? And he answered without hesitation. He said, commitment. He said, our need is to be committed, committed to something or someone. Well, of course, from my perspective, that someone would be Jesus Christ. Are you committed? Are you committed to Jesus Christ? Because you see, in this period of time, our moral ability is lagging behind our technological ability. And it could mean disaster and catastrophe for the human race. Because many world leaders are predicting that we may have a disaster in this decade. Some incident like we've been seeing in the Middle East or in the South Atlantic or some other place in the world could spread and engulf the whole world in something we all pray will never happen. Ann Landers on Tuesday this week and the statesman quoted Dr. Jules Messerman, who is the president of the World Association for Social Psychiatry. He said this, quote, acknowledged experts in international and military affairs agree that unless present trends are reversed, chances of four in five that a nuclear war will destroy civilization by the end of the next decade. Now those are, are, are intellectuals. It's not some fundamentalist clergyman out here that used to talk about the end of the world. The end of the world now is being talked about at the universities, in the halls of government, by political leaders, and wherever military people gather. So the greatest need in the world today is to go at the root of man's problem and see what causes war. Well, I'll, I'll read it to you. In the fourth chapter of James, it says, from whence come wars? Where do wars come from? James is asking the question, where do wars come from? Where do fightings come from? Then he answers it. Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your hearts? You lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight in war and you have not because you ask not. In other words, we don't turn to God. And so the fighting goes on inside our hearts and then fighting takes place in our homes. The disagreements and the arguments and all the rest and that spreads out into the community and soon into the world and we have a world war. And more people have died in this century in war than all the rest of the centuries put together. In the two great world wars and the many other wars that have been fought. And now we are facing the possibility of a third world war in which people will fight in outer space perhaps. And where the most horrible weapons that you can imagine are being developed, not only by the major superpowers, but by the little countries of the world. I'm not so concerned that the United States and the Soviet Union may start throwing atomic bombs at each other, as I am some little country with some unstable person at the head of it, would start a chain reaction that would involve the superpowers that could destroy the world in a matter of hours. That could happen except for one thing. God has a different plan for the human race. God is not going to allow us to destroy ourselves. There is going to be Armageddon. And as we stand on the threshold of Armageddon, God is going to intervene in the affairs of men and Jesus Christ is going to come back again and set up his kingdom and there's going to be the kingdom of God. 
And if you know Christ as your Savior, you're going to reign with him in that kingdom. And that's the hope of every true believer. But people are frightened. The last time I saw General Omar Bradley was at the inauguration of President Reagan. And I remember that the reception at the White House that evening, he was rolled in in a wheelchair. And it had been my privilege to know him for a number of years. And I'd already spoken to him two or three times that day. And when the president came in, the president looked all around and all of a sudden he spotted General Bradley. And he stopped what he was saying and went down and shook hands with him because he's the last of the five-star generals, the great generals that came out of World War II. And since that time, General Bradley said this. He's gone on now, but between that and his death, he said, ours is a world of nuclear giants and ethical infants. We know more about war than we know about peace, more about killing than we know about living. We've grasped the mystery of the Adam and rejected the Sermon on the Mount. And how true that is. Jesus said, you must be born again. Start with your hearts. Be born from above. You can be changed. The world could be changed. The country can be changed. A state can be changed. A family can be changed. A person can be changed. You can be changed. Now Nicodemus must have been stunned when Jesus said that to him. Because if Christ had said that to Zacchaeus, who's a tax collector, and they didn't like tax collectors then much more than they do now. And then or if he'd said it to the woman at the well who'd had five husbands and was living with another man who was not her husband, or the thief on the cross, or the woman taken in adultery. But to say it to Nicodemus, one of the great religious leaders of his time, Nicodemus, it says, was a ruler. That meant that he was rich. He was religious, and yet he was searching for reality. How many of you go to church, but you're still searching? There's still an empty place in your heart, and something tells you inside that you're not really right with God. You see, Nicodemus fasted two days a week. Do you know anybody in your church that does that? He spent two hours every day in prayer. How many people do you know that spend two hours every day in prayer? He tithed all his income. Not many people even do that these days. He was a professor at the theological school of theology, and he worked hard at religion. But Jesus said, Nicodemus, that's not enough. You must be born again. Born from above. Now, why did Jesus say that to Nicodemus? Because he could read the heart of Nicodemus. He saw what was in him. He saw that he had covered himself with religion, but he had not yet found the real thing, fellowship with God. What causes all of our troubles in the world, lying and cheating and hate and prejudice and social inequality and ultimately war? Jesus said, these things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man. He said, it's in our heart. He said, our hearts need to be changed. Psychologists and sociologists and psychiatrists all recognize there's something wrong with man. There are many words in scripture to describe it. I'll take only three words. One is called a transgression. Sin is a transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. Sin is a transgression of the law. What law? The law of Moses, the Ten Commandments. Have you ever broken one of those commandments? Then you're guilty of all. It's also the breaking of the law of conscience. Have you ever gone against your conscience at any time? Sure you have. And if you go against your conscience very long, your conscience becomes dull and duller and duller until after a while it's a seared conscience and a dead conscience. And your conscience is no longer a safe guide to go by. It leads you astray because you've gone against it so much. And then there's another commandment, law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and strength and mind and thy neighbor as thyself. Have you always done that? No. Then you're a sinner in need of forgiveness, in need of being born again. And then another word carries with it the idea of missing the mark or coming short of your duty and a failure to do what you ought to do. The Bible says all unrighteousness is sin. 
all unrighteousness is sin. And yet, before you can get to heaven, you must, you must have righteousness. God says, be perfect as I'm perfect, holy as I'm holy. Where are you going to get that perfection? You don't have it now. Where are you going to get that holiness? You don't have it now. But you can't get to heaven if you don't. The Bible says, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Thus, a radical change is needed by every person. We need those sins forgiven. We need to be clothed in the righteousness of God for the purpose of finding fulfillment in this life, finding something to commit yourself to. What are you committed to? Are you a committed person? Do you really believe in a cause? Do you really believe in a person that symbolizes that cause? Why don't you make your cause Christ and follow him? He'll never let you down. And then not only to find complete fulfillment in this life, but also to be acceptable with God. To be acceptable by God. Now some of you would ask the question, what is the new birth? Nicodemus asked that question. He said, how can a man be born when he's old? You see, Nicodemus, like you and me, he wanted to understand it. He wanted to understand it. Now, I used an illustration years ago that I couldn't understand because I was born and reared on a dairy farm. And I still wake up at night with nightmares doing this way. <laughs> because I had to get up every morning during high school at 3 o'clock and milk 20 cows. And then when I came home from school, I had to milk those same 20 in the afternoon. My father had a small dairy, had about 60 cows that we milked and then we would sell the milk door to door, have a little dairy truck that took the milk early in the morning. And that's all I remember almost as I was a boy because we worked hard on that dairy farm. But how can a black cow eat green grass and produce white milk and yellow butter? I don't understand that. Well, I'll tell you what, because I don't understand it, I'm never gonna drink milk again. I've got to understand that before I can drink milk. I almost quit milk when the cow stepped in the bucket and it just kept on milking. <laughs> I don't understand color television. Do you know that I am so old that I can remember when there was no television? <laughs> and I tell that to one of my grandchildren, they look at me as though I came out of the ark. I can remember when there were, we didn't have any radio. In fact, I remember the first station that came on there. It was KDKA in Pittsburgh, and my dad had an old crystal set, and he said, I think we've got it. Got earphones, and we'd all stand around to try to listen. The only station on there in the United States. That's how old I am. Well, you can't imagine a world without paved highways. You ought to have seen the two ruts in front of our house that went clear to town. They were on the two paved streets in our whole town. Well, suppose I would say, because I don't understand television, how somebody can be in Rome or New York or Jerusalem or someplace like that, and I can see him instantaneously on my set. I don't understand it. I'm not going to watch it. And I push the button to turn it off. I've got to understand it first. Well, you'd say you're crazy. Well, of course, I don't understand these computers. I don't understand all these things that they're developing. This whole scientific age has passed me by. We didn't study that in the school I went to many years ago. They didn't even know about it. How could they teach you? But I don't understand all that. But I accept it by faith. And when a surgeon, I've had several operations, and when a surgeon at uh, the hospital goes to operate, I may not understand the whole procedure, but I trust him. How do you go about proving your mother's love in a, in a laboratory? You can't. You see, Nicodemus could see only the physical and the materialistic. And Jesus was talking about the spiritual. Jesus said, you must be born again. Now, when he said that, he did not mean that you can inherit it. You cannot inherit it. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Your father and mother can be the greatest born again Christians in the world, but that doesn't make you a born again Christian. I can be born in a garage, but that doesn't make me a motor car. <laughs> and there are many people that have the idea 
that because they are born in a Christian home that they're automatically Christians. Well, you're not. And you cannot work your way alone. Not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And then reformation is not enough. You can reform and say, I'm going to turn over a new leaf and I'm going to have New Year's resolutions and all the rest of it. Isaiah said, all our righteousness is filthy rags and rags in the sight of God. Take a pig and take him into your living room and into the bathroom, give him a good bath, wash him down with some Chanel number no. five, <laughs> put a ribbon around his neck, bring him in the living room. You say, now I've got a new pig. He's, he's turned into a perfect gentleman. Look at him sitting over there. You open the door, let the pig out and see where he goes. His heart hasn't been changed. Only the outside had been changed. And that's the way with some of us. We've been changed some on the outside to conform to certain social standards or certain things that are expected of us in our churches. And yet down inside, we've never been changed. Now that's what Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about. He said, Nicodemus, you need changing inside. And only the Holy Spirit can do that. You must be born from above. That's a supernatural act of God. The Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin disturbs you about the fact that you've sinned against God. And then secondly, the Holy Spirit regenerates you. That's when you're born again. And then the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart, to help you in your daily life. You don't leave here alone without any help. The Spirit of God goes with you from now on to give you assurance, to give you joy, and to produce fruit in your life, and to teach you the Scriptures. You can't reform. That's not enough. And you can't imitate. You try to imitate Christ. They used to have, a, there was a book Sheldon wrote called In His Steps. And people thought that all you had to do is try to follow Jesus and try to do the things he did and you'd get to heaven. You can't do it. We can't live up to the Sermon on the Mount. You try living up to the Sermon on the Mount, literally. You can't do it. You don't have that kind of spiritual strength. Now, to be born again means, in Ezekiel 36, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. In Romans, Paul speaks of it as being alive from the dead. In 2 Corinthians, he calls it being a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. In Peter, Peter says, partakers of a divine nature. John calls it passing from death unto life. The new birth brings about a change in the whole philosophy and manner of living. Now, how is it accomplished? What happens? Well, there's a mystery. Jesus said the wind blows where it listed, and you cannot tell from whence it cometh or where it goeth. You can see the result. Now, the other day, I did not see, when we had that terrible storm a couple days ago, I did not see the wind, did you? I saw the effects of it. I saw limbs flying by, parts of a roof torn off flying by, the dust going by. The willow tree is bending over. I saw the results of the wind, but I never actually saw the wind. And neither did you. You see, the wind blows where it listeth, Jesus said. There's a mystery to it. And Jesus did not attempt to explain it to Nicodemus. You see, that's why we're to come by faith to Christ. We can never understand it. Our little finite minds cannot understand the infinite. Our finite minds cannot understand the mighty God. We come by simple childlike faith and put our faith in Jesus Christ. And when you do, you are born again. But it happens this way. First, there has to be the reception of the Word of God. And I believe that is conception. First Peter 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And then in Romans 10, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now tonight you are hearing, and you're hearing the Word of God, and that's the first step. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching, or declaration, or proclamation to save them that believe. It sounds foolish that men can stand up and use words out of a Bible, and that has power to penetrate your heart and change your life. But it does. 
because it's God's holy word. This is not an ordinary book. This is a living book, a living word. And then there's the work of the Holy Spirit, as I've already explained. He convicts. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And then he indwells. He changes us. He changes our wills, our affections, our objectives for living, our disposition. He gives us a new purpose and new goals. All things pass away and everything becomes new. And then he indwells. Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Does God the Holy Spirit live in you? You remember the story in the Bible of Naaman? Naaman was the general command in chief of all the armies of Syria and Syria is much in the news these days. He was command in chief. He had everything. The king had honored him. But he was a leper. And he knew that in a short time he was going to be thrown out of the military and he was going to be just a a person going around with a little bell saying keep away keep away keep away I'm a leper I'm a leper I'm a leper and he heard a little slave girl from Israel tell about a wonderful man that could heal him over in Israel and he went to his king and the king said if anybody in Israel can heal you please go and he went and when he finally came to this man after a number of experiences the prophet said, go to the Jordan and dip seven times, and on the seventh time you will be healed. He told a servant to tell him that, in fact, the prophet didn't even come out to see the general. The general was there in all of his uniform and all of his men, and the prophet just stayed back in the kitchen somewhere, didn't even come out and greet him, just sent word to him. And the general turned away in disgust. But one of his captains said to him, or one of his aides said, Sir, if he had told you a hard thing, you would have done it. He said, go to the Jordan. He said, yeah, but the Jordan River is muddy and our rivers are clear. That Jordan River can't do anything. He said, but why don't you try, sir? You're a leper. You've got to do something. So the general went to the Jordan River and he dipped himself four or five times and he said, see, the leprosy is still there. It doesn't do any good. But sir, he said seven times. So Naaman went down for the seventh time, and when he came up, his skin was clean and whole. The thing that had saved him was the fact that he did what the prophet had told him. The greatest prophet of them all is Jesus Christ. And he says, you must be born again. How do you become born again? Repenting of sin, that means you're willing to change your way of living, and you'll say to God, I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. Simple, childlike, and then by faith receive him as your Lord and Master and Savior. And then be willing to follow him in a new life of obedience in which the Holy Spirit helps you as you read the Bible and pray and witness. If there's a doubt in your mind that you have been born again, I hope you'll settle it before you leave here tonight because the Bible says now is the accepted time 